Welcome to Inside Racing. On the Tuesday before the Golden Slipper of 1968, I was dispatched to Rose Hill Racecourse by Sydney radio station 2GB to record some interviews with the slipper trainers and jockeys. One of the first well-known faces I spotted that morning was that of champion Melbourne jockey Roy Higgins, who was in Sydney to ride Biscay in the slipper. Now I'd met Roy on one previous occasion, and only briefly at that, and I certainly didn't expect him to remember me. Imagine my amazement when he walked out of his way to shake hands with a young aspiring Sydney race caller. That's the kind of bloke Roy Higgins was then, and that's the kind of bloke he was right throughout his illustrious career. I'm in Roy's Melbourne home right now, and I'm about to introduce you to a true Australian racing legend. The Professor. Roy the boy. Welcome, son. Lovely to be here, mate. Take How a are seat. You? Take Thank a you. seat. Well done. Welcome to Melbourne. Thank you, mate. Now, Roy, you were born in the little border town of Coondrook on the Melbourne side of the Murray, but you weren't there long. <laughs> my old boy, uh, my dear old loved father, he's passed away many years ago now. He um, had those marvellous animals, those old Clydesdales, the big, big draft horses and uh, he was working his way with them through from the, Wim the Wimmera district and he was working his way through that area down into the Riverina uh, where he had a government position to dig part of the Mulwala Canal. It was there where Dad stopped over to dig a dam or do something with the uh, marvellous Clydesdales uh, that I was born, a little uh, nurse's home in Coondrook mm -hmm. and three or four days later over the bridge into uh, Barham, Barham or however you wish to say it and uh, there I was in New South Wales. So I was a Victorian for a few days. When did your aspirations begin to become a jockey? Can you remember when you first started to dream about it? Once again, I suppose, uh, um, early days we moved into a home in Deniloquin uh, where when the horses weren't working, they'd be in the paddock beside the house and um, if I couldn't be found when I was two, three years of age, and mum would just go on the paddock next door and there I'd be swinging on the tails of these magnificent Clydesdales and climbing around their feet, feet that big, mm. and there I'd be sitting between their hind legs or sliding down their necks into their feed bin. And Mum was horrified. And, oh, <laughs> you yeah. say that again. And we were, we were actually living next door to the stable. And at the age of ten, nine, ten, in, around that area, mm. Um, Jim Wattis uh, next door at the stables just said to me one day, I think I was in there collecting a ball that went over the fence or some damn thing and, and uh, he said to me, he said uh, how'd you like a job at the weekends picking up all that manure in the yards and raking the yards and, and, and that sort of thing. So you started on the bottom rank. Right? <laughs> I, uh, I said uh, yes I could do that Mr Wattis and he said well you know, there'll be two shillings there for you if uh, if you wish to come here of a Saturday morning and a Sunday morning and clean them up and then again in the evening. Two bob. Two bob. Two bob. A fortune oh, to a nine-year-old. Bit of Kerry Packer in me, mate. Ooh. I started down low. That's a lot and of comics. <laughs> <laughs> and I was that good. Now, this is where that all started. I was that good at picking up manure. Yeah. He offered me a full-time job, seven days a week, but still two shillings a week. Never, ever had an inkling that I was going to be a jockey. Never had a... Um, just because I could ride horses. I didn't think there was anything about uh, to becoming a jockey. For some unknown reason, I'd, uh, I thought I was going to be a carpenter. Now, why? Maybe because I was hopeless, hopeless once I got past about fourth or fifth grade in school. Uh, I was a terrible student. And, but I, was, I loved going to the woodwork courses because you didn't have to add up. Mm. subtract or, or do algebra and all mm. that sort of thing and it was my boss was the old boss Jimmy Wattis um, mm. he started then leading me out to the track of a morning on the thoroughbreds because uh, I was only a little whippersnipper and I used to have trouble carrying the buckets of water though that's how small I was mm. and um, he used to then start about I was about 12 he'd lead me out to the track of a morning and then other boys would ride the horses work he had two sons that were jockeys mm. and then uh, he'd put me on them and he'd lead me back and and that sort of thing until i got to be able to ride out on my own and so yeah, on and well so he, on that he was obviously he, a pretty sensible bloke yeah he he uh mind he, you, he hastened slowly well I, i'd been working in the stables just on three years before he put me on a thoroughbred your first winner first winner was about uh in my seventh ride 
Uh, Horses name? Statutory. Statutory. And the diggers handicap at Deniliquin, a race over 1,600 metres. And that's, that's how, how it all got going. How did you get to Melbourne? Um, we had a little horse, a little two-year-old, actually, up at uh, up home. We'd won the two races with her, um, called Silver Knight. Oddly, not the Silver Knight that won a Melbourne Cup. No. And oh, she was a frisky little thing. We won a race at home, I think, or Benalla and somewhere else. Anyhow, the boss said, uh, I was only about 17, 16, 17, he said, uh, we're going to take her down to run at Mooney Valley. I said, oh, good, who are you going to get to ride her? And he said, oh, you'll be coming down. I said, oh, not me, leave me out of that. I don't want to go near the city. The confidence factor? Yes, factor. yes. You He's, still hadn't built up confidence? No, no. Oh, in the early days, he used to have jocks come up home, guys like uh, Kevin Mitchell, Dougie Barclay, Frankie McIntyre, and those guys who, was a very, who had been successful in the Metropolitan. They'd turn up to our little meetings up there. Yeah. And I was petrified of them straight away. My conference was on the floor. Right. I just learnt to, to work at a level with my regular competitors. And these, when these uh, Metropolitan guys, the city jocks, had arrived, yeah. that was it. My conference just dropped straight down again. Roy, anyway. you realise it wasn't many years after they all felt the same way about you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but I made a lot of great mates with them. But yeah. then we, we bought this Silver Knight down. She'd never seen a starting gate. We got a couple of little sheep gates, put them together, and a little thing on the front. We kept swinging it in front of her and all that sort of thing. Imagine how, how professional that would be to a starting gate. Yeah. Um, I'd never been in one. Gates opened, there I was last again. Missed a start by two lengths. I thought, well, where, where, what do I do now? I'm at Mooney There's a Valley. funny side to it. Yeah, there is a funny side to it. Yeah. I said, look, Roy, I was always told the shortest way home is the best way home, and that's round by the running. So I said, I'll stick to the fence and hope. That's yeah. all I can do. So I did. Never went round a horse. And 20, 50 metres from, from the post, I got up on the inside of the great Bill Williamson on a Fred Hoisted train, Father Hoisted, the great, the king of two-year-olds, yeah. on a four-to-one on favourite called Posh. I got up on his inside and I missed him by a half head. I was 33 to one, he was mm. four-to-one on. And um, that was my first go at it. And uh, the boss yeah. patted me on the back. I said, come on, boss, let's get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to get on the, in the float and go home. Now, Roy, Bill Williamson, mm -hmm. as you flash past the post that day, would never have dreamed how much you thought of him. He no. was the jockey that was to become your role model and your inspiration. Bill was the one to me that I felt comfortable being behind or being with. When I, when I, I felt secure with him. I thought he was that great. He knew no. where he was going. Yes. Yeah, he never yeah. pulled the wrong rein. He, he very, very seldom did I find myself in trouble by being somewhere where Bill Williamson was. And I think yeah. that's always stuck in my mind. And I, I, I used to idolise watching him and I'd study him and watch him. He, Weary Willie, yeah. that was his nickname, never smiled. He would sit in the room on his own. Never talk to anyone, but that's how he wanted Williamson riding him out with hands and heels. Ray Ribbon finishes well into second place, historic era third, but it's rising fast. Caulfield Cup, his second in succession, and it's a win that deserves and gets one of the greatest ovations that Caulfield's ever seen. Four group ones with some amazing statistics thrown in. Eight Futurity Stakes, seven VRC Sires Produce Stakes. I got weary looking at the records, but there is one race, one occasion, one day that reigns supreme in the Roy Higgins scrapbook. The 1965 Melbourne Cup on the gallant little lady, mm. Light Fingers. And I've only got to look around this room. You're not a collector of memorabilia. No, I'm not a hoarder. But there are plenty of mementos of Light Fingers in this room. Why? Pride and joy. Um, <clears throat> I came back from France in 64. I was walking onto the course one day at Caulfield and this gentleman was leaning over the fence, whom I knew, a guy called Mr Broderick, Wally Broderick. Um, he said, Roy, have you any ties? Uh, for the three-year-old fillies coming up this year. And I said, no, Mr Broderick, I, I've got no ties at all. I haven't got a stable to ride for. I'm freelancing. And he said, um, 
got a filly over in uh, Adelaide that is trained by a guy called Bart Cummings, I so I've heard of him, mm. and uh, he said he thinks she could make it. Uh, now, he said he's asked me to look out for a rider in Melbourne because he had no ties here in Melbourne either. And uh, so he said, when she comes over, you ride her work and can you give us opinion if you like her? We, he wants, to, he wants mm. someone to ride her all the time. So uh, two weeks later, she came over. I went over into the stables and Bart wasn't there. There's only strap and out come this skinny little thing and mm. ribs everywhere, hips sticking out the side. It looked like one of your trotters, John, you know, mm. the, very ungainly <laughs> type, you know. <laughs> and uh, There's just been a major switch off from standard <laughs> bread lovers around Australia. <laughs> uh, yeah. But... Uh, and, and plain, oh, and small, yeah. oh dear. And I went out and I just canned around the big sand at Flemington and I come back in, I said, oh gee, she's a sweet filly. I said, who ever could give a horse a name like this? Light fingers, sweet little thing like this. And yeah. it turned out the best name I've ever heard of. Mm. And that was to start it all. Mm. And so not only did we clean sweep, uh, the three-year-old filly's classics, including the Oaks. and Gosh, and she meant so much to you. Well, and it started started me with Bart Cummings. Mm. Uh, Sixteen years we yeah. were together. So, not only did I combine with a horse I fell in love with, she was mm. a jockey's dream. You know, horses like that can make ordinary jockeys look good. And at that time, to get my confidence going, I needed a horse like yeah, that. Yeah. And she was it. And to combine with her to win a Melbourne Cup, I got off of the ride a week before when she was having trouble going into the race. She had a shoulder problem. Yes, we, she was scratched on the yeah. eve of the Caulfield Cup when she was a very short price favourite. Mm. And uh, she was just that restricted in her work because it was all in the papers, everyone saying she's got no hopes, no, she's going out, she's only working even time and she's got no mm. hope of running in a Melbourne Cup. Okay, Roy, coming around the turn in 65 and in the back of your mind, you know how much work this little mare has missed. You're thinking, how can she possibly win? Is that the thought that was running through your mind? I'm coming into the straight, but there's a great big black bludger in front of me called Zaima. Now Zaima, who's a stable made of light fingers, was a terrible horse. To us. He wouldn't go on the track of a morning, he'd jack up. And I used to use light fingers, she used to work with him yeah. as the lead pony. I'd drag him onto the track and when I seen him, in front of me, yeah. he shot to the front. I just thought to myself, I can't let that so big so. bludger beat you, yeah. Mama. Come on, Mum, we've got to get him. Don't yeah. let him beat us. You know, I'm talking to myself, you know. Yeah. Um, and the, I think the, the last... Must have broken your heart. It, the last 200 metres of that race, it, it, uh, when I pulled up, I just felt like crying. Not because I won a Melbourne Did Cup. Did you know you'd won? Yes, because, uh, because I'd hit her so damn hard. Yeah. And uh, I was, you know, a pretty strong whip rider, and oh, geez, I just felt, I, knew, I felt sick. Uh, I, I didn't want to look round because I knew there'd be whale marks all over her backside. And, you know, when you get so close to a horse, and, the, and when you say, "Did I know I'd won?" I thought I'd won. I thought I was quite confident I'd won. Uh, but 50 yards past the post, my old mate Joe Miller, pretty tight with a quid, he didn't, never gave much away. He said, "Just got you, mate." I said, don't think so, John. I said, I think I've just beaten you. No, no, no. He said, I've got you. But he said, look, being a Melbourne Cup, he said, we're mates, uh, stable mates, the horses and that. He said, I'll save 500 with you. Uh, they were pounds in those days. Mm. He said, I'll save 500 with you, only because we're mates. And when he said that, I knew I'd won. That really made me get my confidence up. Yeah, when Jay yeah. Miller wanted to save 500, yeah. I knew I'd won. I said, go away, leave me alone. It's coming back to scale. I'll never forget this. Trotting back to scale with a mama and I rubbed her backside, hope it wasn't stinging and all this sort of thing. <laughs> and uh, the, I'm getting towards the uh, the judges' town. Those days, it used to take about three or four minutes yeah. to uh, for the for the numbers to go up in the frame. They used to pull them up on a rope, you know. Yeah. And uh, anyhow, here I'm under my thing, and I'm just lifting my skull cap off uh, as I'm just getting near the judges' box and. Old Jim McCaffrey, the old clerk of the course at the time, trotted up. He said, uh, what are you doing, Roy? I said, I'm just get, trying to get my cap off. It was on pretty tight. Mm. He said, the course broadcaster's gone for Zaima outright. Straight out to win. Yeah, Joe Brown. Joe Brown. And you wouldn't believe it, 
Have you ever seen a guy trying to pretend you had an itch on the side of your head and, and get your skull cap <laughs> to save back, embarrassment? To save embarrassment, get <laughs> yeah. your skull cap back, and yeah. it actually flashed through my mind. Thinking, I wonder how far behind me Johnny Miller is. I might take that five hundred. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's <laughs> and then there's massive roar. Yeah. Massive roar. Now I knew the roar wouldn't have been for Zaima. Yeah. Now I couldn't see the numbers, I ran the other side, yeah. up the top. Mm. But when the roar went up, it was that loud, I knew it had to be mum, mm. mother as I call it. Yeah. And uh, so as soon as I got around the other side and looked up and there it was, well that's Gold Cup, it just came straight off. Yeah. As quick as I could. So yeah. Roy, you should see the sparkle in your eye when you talk about that now. I mean She's your favourite oh, yes. of yeah, all the greats you wrote. Yes, um, I don't think no, I got very close to another good mayor, very, very good mayor, Leilani. But it was a different closeness. Mm. This one was embedded in me. Yeah. No one, but no one or nothing was ever going to touch it. Yeah. it I've bedded that one down. That's mother. That's that's white fingers. The others can come along. And uh, I knew because being an animal lover, I'd get close to a lot of them. But yeah. I was never ever, I, I was going to guard, guard with jealousy mm. my love for her. Anybody's race a furlong and a half to go where Red Hand had got to the front momentarily from Volition. Red Crest is joining in down the outside and Pad the Way is coming home well. It's Red Hand and then Red Crest, the two Reds in front with Pad the Way getting up on the inside. Red Crest just in front and here's Floodbird with a great run. It's Red Hand and Red Crest, they're going stride for stride. Red Hand got his head in front. Red Hand in front, close to home and won the cup. I must say I went into that race with a lot more confidence than what I did with Light Fingers, yeah, so yeah. just the same. Uh, I ran second on him in the Caulfield Cup to the great Tobin Bronze, and a little bit unlucky. I, mean, I remember Bart, uh, when I came in, he said, uh, I just dismounted, and he said, oh, bad luck. And I said, yes, but I said, well, win the Melbourne Cup. He said, oh, well, I'll cop that then. I'll yeah. accept Bart said, oh, well, I'll accept that. Yeah. And on that spot, that I just said, yeah, we'll win the Melbourne Cup. And yeah. I, there was nothing happened between that day and Melbourne Cup Day yeah. to, to vary my, my yep. feeling and my thoughts. He went on, he trained, trained perfectly. Mm. You know, I used to ride him work every morning and he just trained so perfectly for the race. You know, it's hard to say you, you can walk out in a Melbourne Cup yeah. uh, oozing confidence yeah. and looking at, uh, looking at the cup over there and saying, oh, in a few yeah. minutes' time I'll be handling that. Well, you weren't feeling sort of that thing. way at the film. No, <laughs> the bird had flown. <laughs> yeah. No, I'll never forget that. I had a lovely run in the race and uh, just yeah. came into the race. And I sort of uh, moved out. I got a couple of leaders out there and I just come out from behind them and I looked at them and I thought, I've got you guys all covered. Yeah. You're sweet. And then just I could see this head coming and I thought, hey, come on, get yeah. going, mate. And oddly enough, there wasn't the acceleration there that I expected. Yeah. I thought I had more in the tank than I did yeah. because he'd had a good run in the race. And then, lo and behold, I find myself, I've gone for the whip and this thing just keeps coming. It wouldn't go away. And next minute it's in front of me. Mm. And I never, never lost confidence that he was ever going to get away from me. But, but I thought, gee, you know, he's got a head in front of me. This shouldn't be mm. happening. Mm. And I kept thinking to myself, I know you've had such an easy run. You, you, I'm going to call him bugger, but he was a good, honest horse. Uh, you've got to dig deep. You know, you, you've still got to have some petrol left in the tank because you've had such an easy run. Actually, I won the Melbourne Cup, but still walked away thinking I should have won that a lot easier than yeah, that. You know, yeah. uh, but uh, that's it. I still won. Yeah. Still won. But it didn't. It, and yeah. I didn't. I didn't walk off the Flemington with that spring in my step that I did when I won on my fingers. No, I can tell you that. Yeah. I tell you that. Now, Roy, you had a long and freakishly successful association with Bart Cummings. Um, part of Australian racing folklore. Mm -hmm. Was it always smooth going or were there hiccups along the way? Um, yes, I would say the majority of it uh, was smooth going. Bart's a guy that uh, you never really get close to Bart Cummings. You know, Bart's... An island Bart's, under himself? Bart's a close man, but to himself. Uh, and that's that, but that's bad. That, that's not because of me or anyone else. Uh, that's he's a very deep thinking person. Takes so much in. 
you know, little things. You just stand there and listen to your talk when you've ridden a horse work or after a race. And he wants to, he wants to take all that in. He, he doesn't interrupt you. He'll just take it all. And you never know whether you've satisfied him, you haven't. You know, I was around with Bart for, for 16 years, but uh, as you say, highly successful. Without him, without Bart Cummings, you know, you were reading out there earlier, John, you know, the group ones, groups twos, the, the listed races and so on. When you go back through them, 80% were trained by Bart Cummings. So you can imagine, without him, would I have ever reached the heights that I was able to achieve here in Australia? So, you know, I just owe that man so much. So I'm not going to, you know, we had a, a difference towards the end. I was getting too heavy and, and probably, as he said, too lazy. And Bart could see what was happening with me. I didn't realise it. But uh, he could see that, you know, the sparkle's probably gone out and having massive weight problems and all that sort of thing. And then we, we had a fallout over a mare called Philly, called Silver Shoe. She came over from Adelaide and Pat Cummings, his brother, had asked me to ride her work. She's very touchy but very good, he said. Very good. Touchy, ride her early in the morning before there's too much activity around. And I'd put a couple of weeks into her. And um, with... Uh, Good result for me, I thought, any. I said, this is unbeatable. And um, I was coming back, I was riding old Ming Dynasty work. And I bring me back, and I see Harry going out on this silver shoes. I said, Harry, bring that back. He said, why? I said, Harry, bring it back. I said, I'll ride it work. And he said, uh, uh, oh, he said, Bart sent me out on it. And I said, I don't care. I said, bring it back. I'm riding it Saturday. So Harry trotted on back with me, and... and uh, Bart said, go on, Harry, where you go? I said, Bart, I'm riding that. I said, I'm riding on Saturday, it's got 57. No, he said, uh, uh, Harry's riding on Saturday because uh, he said, you can't ride the filly's weight in the Blue Diamond, had about 51, 52 kilos, and she's going for the Blue Diamond. And I said, uh, Bart, that's a month, five, six weeks away, a lot can happen between now and then. I said, I'll put all the work in here. Uh, I said, I'll ride her on Saturday and we'll work it out after that. And he just turned to me, he said, I'm the boss, I said, Harry's rider, and that's how it's going to be. I said, well, was that the case? And so I was naturally filthy. Um, so that was the beginning of the end? I actually, I'll never forget it. I, I threw, the, threw the reins. Old Ming Dynasty was a lovely old quiet horse, thank goodness. And I said, is that the case here? I said, you can keep your horses. And I threw the reins, and the reins were all but going round Bart's neck. And fortunately, old Ming sort of threw his head back a bit and the buckle landed on top of Bart's head. Otherwise, if the race got around his neck, that wouldn't have been a pretty sight. J.B. Cummings being dragged around by Ming Dynasty in the, in the centre of Royal Flemington. And, I said, and that was it. I turned my back and, and just walked away. I just walked away. Maybe, I don't know, maybe because of that, um, it, it might have sort of spurred me on again because I went in and out in the new fields. And so writing work for Colin Hayes, uh, I just actually when I walked away from Bart, Colin was standing there and he had about four or five horses walking around. And I said, uh, "Do you need a track jockey, Col?" He looked at me. He said, "What's wrong?" I said, oh, "We just had a little little fall out there." He said, "Mate, take your pick. What do you want to ride?" We can't possibly do justice to the Roy Higgins story in just one episode, so we're going to continue next time, when Roy will talk about the miseries of the sweat box that dreaded place in which he spent so much of his time and reminisce about his favourite horses. You might be surprised with the name of the horse he nominates as the best he ever rode. All of this on part two of the Roy Higgins story next time on Inside Racing. Until then, many winners. <laughs>